Did you uh, go to church in Holy Sepulchre? Yes. Was that like the grossest thing you've ever seen? It was beautiful. Oh, really? I thought yeah. that was so gross. Like, just, <laughs> oh. I mean, it's, I mean, you can't deny that it's beautiful. Okay, I mean, a lot of, like, it, we are against the belief, not against, we understand there's something there that people are satisfying. We don't deny that there's a sense of awe, a sense of inspiration, a sense of belonging, a sense of community. We know that these are needs people have, and religion pretends to have the answer. And, you know, they do a good job at pretending. And that's why everything looks so beautiful and everything looks so awe-inspiring. We, we're, not, we're not denying that. We just think that we could achieve all that without the belief in the nonsense, right? Yeah. You see, there's still a ladder there, isn't there? That's, that's there that they don't move because there's some sort of detente. And so none of the, the Coptics or the Christians or the Jews or whatever it was, like, all of the Jews. But uh, they and kept the, everything where it was when they had this, this agreement that they wouldn't. Oh, are you, talking, are you talking about the bridge from the... No, it's no? like a ladder that's sitting I didn't in the see church. It. Yeah, they can't move it because... Huh. You know, I didn't notice that. Yeah, it was, it's a strange. It's a strange place. Right. I actually went inside the pr place where Jesus was supposed to be buried before he was resurrected. Yeah, it was a huge line of it. Yeah, but yeah, it was... It, I mean, we went... Um, so that it's very interesting because the people that were there, the closer they, they got to where Jesus was supposed to be, crucified the more they feel like they're getting closer to God and it's very interesting because right next to them the closer the Jews get to the wall the closer they feel like they're getting to God and the Muslims the closer they were getting to this to the rock that Muhammad was ascended to heaven from the rock the closer they felt like they're getting close which is actually I managed to get inside the dome of the rock the quotes uh, but I'm not supposed to because you're supposed to be Muslim to go there but they just asked me the questions. They like say the shaharat. I knew it. They asked me to recite a surah in the Quran. I knew it, so I managed to get in. I mean, the, actually, it was, there's a lot of Israeli soldiers there, so I felt safe. But it was interesting. The, per, the first person that asked me to recite the Quran was an Israeli soldier. And I didn't expect to go to Israel and having an Israeli soldier make me recite the Quran. I'm like, okay. They're so young. Like, how do you, like, they're so young and they have these weapons. They're like, yeah. I wouldn't trust them. <laughs> 18 and 19, 20 year olds at McDonald's with these yeah. weapons. It's incredible. I feel pretty safe. A lot of people tell me, like, don't go to Israel, it's not safe. It felt oh, pretty safe. Yeah, it is. And then in Israel, they told me not to go to Palestine because it's not safe there. I went to Ramallah, I felt very safe there too, yeah. I mean, it's the only place in the Middle East where I could go and see an Islamic community without getting hanged, so it was pretty good. Like, I, now I know I have access to a place where I could go and talk to an entire Muslim community. Wow. Like, That's a tough Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. This, I think it's very safe. It's more, I feel more safe than in Canada, given how much military presence was around me. I feel like there's no way anybody could do anything here. Yeah, oh, it's pretty good. I, I recommend, I, it's very interesting because, uh, you know, Jerusalem, they consider it, um, you know, Muslims consider it theirs, the Jews consider it theirs, and the Christians consider it theirs. And I was telling the atheists there, we, we meet with, with both Israeli atheists and Palestinian atheists, and there's a huge Palestinian atheist community in Palestine, by the way. Um, and I was telling them, this is actually ours. Uh, Jerusalem is a, should be the capital of atheism because all the proofs that all of this is made up is right here. <laughs> <laughs> so you have all the archaeological evidence that this is all stories. It's right here. So this is it, it, this is the capital of atheism. I'm sure you just explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I know that you know a lot of Muslims are really interested in conspiracy theories and stuff like that. So if you actually show them that. <laughs> It's true. What, what do their conspiracy theories look like? I mean, they talk about Dijal and the Illuminati and the Zion. I mean, they're all the same, actually. So Dijal and Zionists and Satanists and the Illuminati, they all got mixed together and become a super conspiracy rather than the individual conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> Dijal? Oh, Dijal is Antichrist. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Dijal is Antichrist in Islam, and Jesus will come back and kill him. According to myself. As, as he does. As he does, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't know about that in Iran. They didn't tell us about Dijal, and I thought it was a Sunni thing only. 
But then I looked at it, like, oh, it's actually Shia hadiths for it as well. So I like, I didn't know why, why nobody told about this. Ex Shia, uh, yeah. Actually, within the ex Muslim community, we have this friendly uh, thing that we say it's like, ex Shias are better than ex Sunnis. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> <And so we, laughs> but we also have a lot of Sunnis tell me that I'm not really ex Muslim because I was Shia. And <laughs> so I was never Muslim to begin with. <laughs> Yeah, like I didn't know I could get tech feared even as an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, tonight, so Armin's going to uh, talk to us. Uh, we might interact a little bit as, as things go on, and then we're going to have a QA and a um, in about, well, we'll kind of determine probably four or five minutes now or something like that. Yeah, so, and we, we, even before the QA, I think there's going to be um, a lot, some interaction. I was hoping there would be, I think. Muslims here. Are, are there any Muslims? No, not ex Muslim. Muslim. Ex Muslim. No, fellow ex Muslims there. Ex Muslim, right? Yeah. But no Muslims? Damn it. We tried. Shame. Okay. One day. <laughs> One day. Yeah. We did market to, uh, to uh, Muslim groups. And yeah. I mean, in UBC in Vancouver, we had some Muslims attending, and I was like, I was like, this is really great. You guys do, don't mind coming to listen to people to, that disagree with you, right? And we, I'm hoping we get more of that, more people that are not afraid of like people disagreeing with them, even have passionate disagreements. With them. And actually, that's mainly what we're uh, we're going to be talking about today. Uh, if you don't mind, we're changing the topic of the discussion. You guys don't mind, right? Because yeah, we yeah. the very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, but given what happened, you know, given a, a lot of the negative um, reactions that we got, to, uh, we're talking about this after the shooting in New Zealand. Um, I thought we we touch on that and why why now it's more important than ever that to talk, like to talk about this, it's especially at the time like when stuff like this happened. But I know, I'm hoping that, you know, the stuff that I say this doesn't go unchallenged. Like I'm hoping like people here actually push back on a lot of the stuff that I have to say. Because I understand a lot of people rightfully so have, think some of the stuff that I say come across as, you know, bigoted or hateful. Uh, and I want to hear those Concerns. I want to hear what those people have to say, especially if if it's from that community. That's why I was hoping there were Muslims here to tell me what I'm getting wrong, or even if I'm not getting it wrong, why my tone is not maybe not helpful. So I want to get those feed that kind of feedback. But yeah. So given that there's no Muslims here, if you could put your Muslim hat on and try to like see if you could say what 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 you think they would say or what what you think. What's problematic with what I'm saying? And I, I'll accept that feedback. And I'll tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where would you like to start? Um, so, I don't know how many people know here, but... So, about a week ago, the... I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all know this, right? In New Zealand, there was a shooting around... Um, has the numbers changed? It was 52, 52 Muslims were shot and um and there's a huge reaction to that rightfully so a lot of people are upset about it and they should be and i and i wish that kind of reaction was also there when when china had put around a million muslims in concentration camps which we tried so hard to talk about it tried to so hard to I mean, I'm even disappointed with our own Atheist Republic community because it doesn't seem to get as much interaction and um, attention as it, as it should. We're talking about a million, million. Like, I don't know, have we ever gotten this close to what Nazi Germany did, like, what, compared to what, you know, this is, this is the closest we've ever been. Chi what China is doing. Saudi Arabia, No, they supported it. Yeah, why? Saudi Arabia supported it. Like, oh, Saudi Arabia is desperate right now for, for support because of, after the Khashoggi stuff, it seems like the international community is abandoning it. So if it's China, it, it'll take it, right? It doesn't really care. I mean, we have, I mean, in Saudi Arabia, the House of Saud and House of Wahhab, they have different agendas. The South, House of Saud doesn't really give a shit about Islam. Uh, but also we, for, for years, 
we have been talking about the killing of Muslims in Yemen um, by Saudi Arabia, backed by United States, backed by Canada, backed by France, backed by UK. Also, Iran is also responsible. The Houthis are also responsible. Uh, many people are responsible, but um, we talked about, like, we, we were not saying the outrage that this deserved. This, the, the situation in Yemen is the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time. I mean, the numbers are astronomical, right? Like the, the number of starvation is being used as a weapon, right? On purpose against children by Saudi Arabia. They're, they're bombing, they were bombing ports just to make sure they don't, that civilians don't get food. And the United States knew that, and both Obama and Trump sold weapons to Saudi Arabia knowing that this is what it's being used for. And we don't see that much outrage for, for something like that. And these are Muslims. I mean, you care about 52 Muslims that were killed in New Zealand, as you should. Good, but where was, where was all this outrage then? And now this, this attack happens. And we, we have a, sorry, we have a very strong stance against Islam. And we do, we don't apologize for it, we don't hold back. And we welcome people's stance against atheism. Right? We welcome that. Like, tell us why you are very much against atheism. Right? We, don't, we, we don't think anybody else should hold their views against atheism, against our positions. Um, but we, we have a lot of people now coming to us and telling us that we are responsible, apparently, somehow, for, for the shootings in New Zealand because of our anti-Muslim rhetoric, like we're helping with narrative. Well, like, you assholes, where, you guys were not, you know, we, you guys were never there when we were talking about so much, uh, you know, crimes against Muslims and now you're blaming us for this? And, and, and the, the fact that they, these people never talk about all those other situations, it, to me suggests that they're, that the fact that they are talking a lot about what happened in New Zealand really doesn't have much to do with them caring about Muslims or trying to protect Muslims. I think Muslims in this situation are being used as a political tool for them to, to sell their narrative. I mean, the fact, it has, it has to be a white nationalist for them to pay attention. Not China, not Saudi Arabia. It has to be white nationalism because their entire uh, career depends on white nationalism being a big thing. You know, their entire, you know, they have defined their entire movement based on that. So they want white nationalism to be a big thing, right? Um, and and they, they want it so much that when it's, when it's not even there, they try to broaden the definition of what that even means. So, so that includes more people. But they, they wait for something like this. They, 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 they look at it as an opportunity. Because again, if it was actually because of a care for Muslims, they would have been speaking about a lot of other things. And again, I'm not, a lot of, when I say this, a lot of people think that I'm saying that we shouldn't care about the 52 people that died in New Zealand. I'm, no, I'm not, nobody is suggesting less attention towards that. People, the only thing we're saying, see, it's not what aboutism if you're saying if you're asking for attention to both. What aboutism is when you look at one wrong and try to excuse another wrong. It's not what aboutism if you think this is wrong. That's also wrong. We need to. You're, you're trying to. You're you're asking for a little bit of consistency, right? Not trying to excuse anything, right? If you said, well, given. What happened, given that we didn't say anything about what happened in China, we shouldn't say also anything about what happened in New Zealand. That's what about us. But if you're asking for attention to both, that is not what about us. Um, but again, I really, I really want to stress how big of a deal this is because the fact that they have made um, their opposition to white nationalism their entire point of existence then you could, you could see how it makes sense for them to suggest a cure for what they see as a problem that actually doesn't cure the problem. It increases the problem, right? And this is why I warn Muslims 
that these are these people are not your allies. You know, these people act like they're you, that they're trying to protect you. They're, that they're guardians of Muslims. That they are. Uh, they elected themselves as people that are protect minorities. But um, but but they, all they're doing is they they're trying to. They are actually responsible for their growth. They're responsible for uh, the rise of the alt right and uh, more bigotry because they are they're shutting down conversations between us right. and more conversations between you and us <coughs> will make it more difficult for us to hate each other right because the more conversations Muslims and critic of Islam have it with each other the more it will become they will normal the more it will become just a disagreement the more it will be an intellectual discussion the less conversation that we have with each other the more it's going to be the more we're going to see each other as the other the the group that is against them and you know shutting out shutting down these conversations and the you know the interesting thing is that if you actually go directly to Muslims uh, and talk to them most of the time after a little bit of discussion they will I have had more success convincing them that my strong opposition against Islam is not a hatred towards Muslim, Muslims. I have had more success convincing Muslims of this than the people that have elected themselves as guardians of the Muslims, right? And to me, this suggests that they're just in the way. You're just in the way. You're just in the way between us having meaningful conversations, and we just need to just go around you. Is there a way that you engage them? Because they must attack, they must attack them online all the time. Right. The social justice warriors or whatever you want to, snowflakes, whatever you want to call them. They must, they must attack you, and then is there a way to engage them, or is it, like you see... Well, I'm, we're going around them now, because we have gone, tried to go through them to talk to the people that we want, and we haven't had much success, right? So we're like, you know, maybe just, we're just going to go talk to the Muslims. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and we have had... So, so it's so ironic. <laughs> it's, 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 it's so ironic. Yeah, and, and I think, like, even, even when we get... See, the, what I say to a lot of Muslims that has helped me convince more of them that this is not about hating you. This is the example I give them. I tell them that imagine a Muslim that hates atheism, really hates atheism with a passion. But why does this person hate atheism? Because in this example, this Muslim thinks that atheists are going to go to hell. And he or she doesn't want atheists to go to hell because she cares for atheists, right? She's worried that they're going to go to hell. She doesn't want, she wants them to go to heaven. Um, and she sees atheism as a disease that is, that is going to make these people suffer. So her hatred for atheism is not a hate because of a hatred for atheists. In, in fact, her hatred for atheism is because her love for, or her care for atheists. And, you know, I, every time I give this example, there's a Muslim right, like, oh, I don't care, uh, you know, people can be atheists. Like, yeah, I'm, but think, in my example, do you see this person, how this person could be against atheism, but not against atheists? In fact, she's against atheism because she's for atheists. And this is, yeah, I get it. So, like, if you see it in this example, how that works, then you should also be able to see how a position against Islam is not necessarily a position against Muslims. Maybe you could, you could say that it's wrong. You could say, well, I think Islam is great and you just don't understand Islam and you just misguided. Okay, maybe all of that, what you're saying is true. But can you admit that maybe I don't understand Islam. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're right. Maybe Islam is the greatest thing ever. And, but can you, even if I'm wrong, can you see that it's it's possible that my disagreements with Islam, or even my hatred for Islam, does not translate to a hatred for Muslims, even if I'm completely being ridiculous about my views about Islam. And that works. A lot of people get it. Like, okay, fine, you're an idiot, you're being ridiculous, you just don't understand Islam, but maybe you're not hateful, okay? So it works. 
And that, but that example has, doesn't seem to work with the, with the people that you just give a whole bunch of names for. I don't know, we call them the regressive lift. Bejina was coined that term, so I'll just use that. I, and I don't think they're idiots. I mean, I think why, the reason why it doesn't seem to work is because it's not about, for, mo for a lot of them, it's not about what's right or wrong or what makes sense or what's logical. It's for them, it's about remaining relevant, right? And for them to remain relevant, there needs to be hate. There needs to be bigotry and there needs to be racism out there. And that's what they're banking on. So after, after New Zealand, when you, like, when you first heard the news, how long did it take for any kind of backlash against your organization? What oh, did it happen? Oh yeah, no, I, it was in the, within hours, there was a tweet with my screenshot of some, my, some of my tweets saying like, look, this is the, this is, these are the kind of tweets that is responsible for this shooting. Like, okay, that's a huge acquisition. I mean, this is a, this would be very similar to say, going out and saying, like if there's an Islamic terrorist attack, right? And I say like, well, okay, see, like this Muslims that are spreading Islam, I'm going to blame them for Islamic terrorist attacks. I mean, that, that's very similar to doing the same thing. Or even uh, more ridiculous than that would be to say, imagine if you had, um, you know, we have 13 countries that atheism is punishable by death, right? Atheism is punishable by death in 13 countries, all of them Islamic. So what if I go out and say, maybe people that believe in God should stop talking about that, the fact that there is a God because your narrative is spreading anti-atheism hatred. I mean, there's 13 countries that are killing atheism. Maybe cool it down with your God belief. Right? Yeah. I mean, that would be ridiculous, right? Um, or even with like what just happened. Imagine if there's an Islamic terror attack and the university came like, okay, we had an imam coming to speak here, but we just had an Islamic terror attack. Maybe cool it down with your Islam. Maybe we should cancel all Islamic events for a week. Um, until people have time to recover from this. That would be ridiculous as well. I mean, we would, we would say that, what the hell does this imam got to do with the Islamic terrorism? I mean, we disagree with this imam. We think he has ridiculous views. We think that his views on Islam are completely uh, primitive and, you know, and we don't understand how could anybody believe in these things. But we wouldn't blame this imam for another Islamic terrorist attack, right? Um, and we welcome this imam telling us why we're, I mean, again, this is, this is just disagreements. It's nothing other than that. But, you know, we have disagreements about many things. I mean, if, if, if a socialist and a capitalist can disagree with each other and you know, fundamentally be against each other's belief, but not think that their disagreement really means that they, they're personally attacking each other, why can we have the same disagreements? Again, the reason this is the reason why people on you know, both sides of this argument, both the regressive left and the anti-Muslim bigots, they benefit from convincing more people that these disagreements is a sign of hatred. Because the anti-Muslim, think about it, if we, if, if as, a, as an Islamic critic and a Muslim, if we could have passionate disagreements with each other and have you know, debates, uh, and then at the, after the event still we'd be friends with each other, go have non-alcoholic drinks with each other. If we could show people that we have, we have this friendship with each other, even, even with this passionate disagreement, I mean, this is something that scares both of these group of people. Because the anti-Muslim bigots, they want to say, look, look, Islam is ridiculous, therefore fuck all Muslims, right? Uh, and the regressive, you know, leftists, they were like, okay, look, these people that hate Islam, they're, they're doing this because they're anti-Muslim bigots, right? So they both want our disagreement with Islam to mean that we hate Muslims. But if we could show the, the world that if we could have more conversations with Muslims and show that, look, we have very passion, and we don't, I don't want to hold back because if we hold back and say like, well, be, tone it down a little bit, no. Because we want to show that, friend, you know, 
Agreements are not, should not be a condition for friendship. We could have disagreement, strong disagreements, and still get along. So if we can show, them, show people that we can have these disagreements and get along, we're basically stealing the focus away from both the anti-Muslim bigots and the regressive leftists, which have built a career in hate. Hate it's, on people. It seems like a lot to ask. Like, like, it just seems like a lot to ask for someone to lay down their, their most important thing, their deeply held beliefs, yeah. and, and even make some sort of concessions about you know, civil dialogue. I mean, they don't have to, okay, it, it's not like they're forced to listen to us. But you kind of need both parties. No, yeah, but, they, okay, so we, we don't need all of them, right? So basically, we, 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 we suggest, even if we have some Muslims, right, that can to, tolerate, I mean, I don't know if tolerate is a good word, if they could, if they could accept us, listen, you know, you know, shitting on Islam, while they're shit on atheism. That's good enough, and if you have other Muslims that are, say, like, okay, I can't deal with you talking about Muhammad that way, all right? You don't have to come to our events, you don't have to go to our pages, you don't have to read our books, you don't have to watch our YouTube videos, nobody's forcing you to do that. But if you're like, but, I, but for the, like, I could say, I'm, let's say I'm a Muslim, let's say I can't tolerate that. If you talk about Muhammad that way, it's just gonna hurt me to the core. But at least can you support the other Muslims that are willing to come and talk to us? Like, at, at least could you see the benefit in that? Like, uh, we, we, I mean, a lot of people tell us, you know, why can't you just let people believe what they want, right? We get that a lot. And like, yeah, when do we force people to believe something else? Like, all we're doing is inviting them to consider something, uh, consider a different way of looking at things, right? In fact, if you don't give people the opportunity to see multiple options, then you're actually the person that is not letting people what they want. Because if, you're, if you have been exposed to only one idea, and that's what the idea that you pick, then that's not really a choice. We are actually providing the choice by giving you multiple <coughs> options, right? Um, but, but even, so, so yeah, they say, why can't you let people believe what they want? But even, even though w when we have these conversations, we think that we are the ones that are giving people multiple options to believe what they want because now they have you know, real options. That's not really th the main point of these conversations, right? Yes, when we, when we have debates with Muslims or Christians, there are some people in the audience that change their opinions, right? We have had thousands of people abandon Islam thousands with it before, you know, uh, with, you know, every year because of what we do. Um, I mean, all you have to do is read the Quran. Uh, <laughs> but but, uh, but the, more than that, more important than that, is not just the people that change their opinions, but the people that seem to be okay with these discussions now. People even like this is a smaller step than actual people leaving the religion. People that used to think like, we shouldn't have this discussion, this is offensive. Uh, to, uh, to people that see that we have these discussions with Muslims, Muslim scholars, Muslim imams, and like, they seem to be okay. like, the imam seems to be okay with having this conversation. They seem to be friendly with each other. And it just normalizes that. Even if they're not convinced that we're right or even if they're convinced that there's anything wrong. Even if they look at that conversation, they were 100% certain that Islam was the best thing ever. And they came out of that conversation and still 100% certain that Islam is the best thing ever. But the only thing that changed is like, this it seems okay, it's just a disagreement. They don't agree with us, it's not a big deal. We disagree with them, they disagree with us. How do you have this conversation? You have two million followers, which is just mind-boggling. So how do you... Now you have these, not con consulates. Consulates? Consulates? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so how many of those do you have and how many countries? Well, Maybe explain what a consulate is. Yeah, I mean, okay, so because it's Atheist Republic, everything is team, uh, uh, with the theme of a republic. So we have consulates in every major city around the world where atheists get to meet with each other and uh, meet each other face-to-face. -face and um, 
yeah, uh, some of the most active ones are in Philippines, Malaysia, Mexico, a lot of them in India, uh, Egypt. Yeah, we have many consulates around the world. But so how do, how do you um, how do you triage the, the the conversations that are going on online and then separating you know having people respond to some of these individuals who are truly seeking who truly want those conversations who want to have the dialogue because it seems you know there's just a lot of arguing going on. Right. And, I mean, it's, so how do you? Well, I mean, the main point of the consulates is not um, again. I, I have nothing against. So let me, the main point is for atheists to find each other rather than to change anyone else's opinion. But the second point is to normalize atheism because when more people see like, holy shit, there's a lot of atheists out there. It, it's just basically the same as the gay rights movement, right? The more people come out as gay, the more people are like, oh, it seems like my coworker that I like was gay or that my sister is gay or that you know, celebrity that I like is gay. And it just becomes not a big deal. So. The more atheists get to uh, are open about their atheism, it becomes not that big of a deal anymore. Uh, but I, I also do think there's a lot there's value in going out and trying to uh, promote atheism. A lot of people think it's too much like religion if you try to promote atheism. Uh, like the problem we have with religion is not that they're promoting it. The problem is that we don't get to respond, right? Like it's not it, we don't. A lot of people are like oh if you promote atheism. It's, you know, you're becoming like Christian and Muslim preachers. And like, they should be able to preach. We, we support Christians promoting Christianity. We support Muslims being able to promote Islam. All we're asking is for us to also give you an alternative. That's all we're asking. We don't see, I mean, we do say something wrong with it because they're wrong, but we support their right to do that, right? Um, and, and we just we just want you know the same opportunity. And in a lot of, in, a, in a lot of places in the world we don't. Like for example, our Malaysian uh, consulate in Kuala Lumpur, they posted a picture of of a of an atheist republic gathering in a bar where atheists got together and they had drinks and they took a picture and they posted it on Facebook and they asked us to post it on Facebook. The government got involved. The government of Malaysia. The deputy minister in Malaysia, there was a call out for my beheading uh, because of spreading atheism in Malaysia, but they said that we need to hunt down these atheists. And imagine, okay, so this got some coverage thanks to uh, Matt Delante and Richard Dawkins and other people, but it, was, it didn't get that much attention. Imagine if any other government official anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, said that we need to hunt down the Jews or we need to hunt down the Muslims. I mean, people are very much anti-Trump and I am anti-Trump for like the Yemen reasons and stuff. Uh, same reason why I didn't like what Obama did in Yemen. But, but people mostly don't like Trump because of his you know, bigotry and anti-Muslim stance and stuff like that. But, Trump would never, uh, I don't think even he would go as far as like, we need to hunt down the Muslims, right? In the United States. This is how, okay, imagine how bad this is. Even in countries like Saudi Arabia or Iran, where, where Jews and Christians do not enjoy the same rights as everyone else, right? They don't enjoy it. But even in those countries, there wouldn't be a government official openly saying, openly saying that we need to hunt down the Jews in Iran or we need to hunt down the Christians in Saudi Arabia. But in a more modern country, apparently it's supposed to be one of the most moderate Islamic countries in the world, like Malaysia, you get to say, we need to hunt down the atheists, and you get to keep your job. Nothing happens to you. I mean, if that doesn't show you how the, how the anti-atheism Hate is accepted and normal. I don't know what else. Will. I mean, we're we're, def our existence is punishable by death in thirteen countries. In one country, being an atheist is an act of terror. Act of terror. You're automatically a terrorist if you're an atheist. Go on, say So, what happened to those guys in the bar? Did any? 
Uh, well, they went into hiding for a long time, and, and, and we didn't talk about them for a long time. So I don't, I'm not going to say what specifically happened because they, they told us they wanted to be on the, sure. yeah. Good reason. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, some of them came out and talked to, one of them anonymously talked to BBC, which was very good. But yeah, I mean, it's not, in Malaysia, again, it's not as bad as, you know, a country like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Bangladesh, Pakistan for atheists. It's not as bad. But still, this is supposed to be the most moderate Islamic country. And the be that means the best you can get from an Islamic country is that they, you're hunted and no, nobody is going to see any consequences for saying something like that. It, it, you, it's not punishable by death or anything, anything like that. But still, this is the best you could expect from an Islamic country. I'm a little ADD, so I can take you down these garden paths. That Go on, do it. But you mentioned Obama and, and Trump, and I find every time we make a comparison with Trump that might, might make him look good, we always have to put a caveat in there. I'm no fan of Trump. <laughs> but so when, when terrorist attacks happen with Obama, yeah. and uh, so either Clinton as a, a Secretary of State would come out and say, this is, this is um, a small group of people, doesn't reflect the whole thing, and, you know, and then have that line. Mm. And then Trump just comes out and says, well, this is a small group of people, and it's not really that, you know, I guess there's non-militant nationalists, I have no idea. But it, did, it seemed like a remarkably similar statement. Um, so what is it, what is the main point? So, 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 so it was, I was just so surprised yeah. that Trump used almost the same line as Clinton or Obama oh, did in the past right. about, about this being a rare event, mm. it's not indicative of the whole movement, and it's bad, right. but then he uses it for the nationalists, and, right. and people lose um, their shit. Okay, but I think they actually both right though, in this situation, because there are people that are very wrong, they are wrong, and there are people that are very, 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 very wrong that are not supporting violence, even though what they believe in is absolutely ridiculous. And I think it's important for us to not group entire people together. Um, I mean, I am very much against Islam, and I think Islam promotes violence. But most Muslims are better than Islam. Most Muslims are better than Islam. I mean, so in Iran, for example, we had a, we had a Quran, and most, most people have a Quran in their home. Uh, and we learned... So why, don't, why doesn't everyone have a Quran in their home? I mean, my uncle doesn't. He has the Shahnameh instead, and he hates... Um, okay, never mind this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, but... Um, Okay, so where was the thing? Oh, yeah. So we have a Quran in our home, and what do you do with it? It's, it's sitting in the shelf. I mean, in school, we have we learn a little bit about the Quran by selected verses, right? But the Quran itself, um, we take it out during New Year's. We put it as decoration. We kissed it for good luck. We waved it around our head for before traveling for uh, for protection. We did a lot of things with it, but we never read it, right? <laughs> And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't understand, like, this is supposed to be a book written by the creator of the fucking universe, right? And it's not like people don't read books. People read a lot of books. Like, even as kids, I remember, like, a lot of us read Harry Potter, for example. Like, okay, you have time to read books, but you don't really have time to read the book that was written by the creator of the universe specifically for you. I, I did not understand how it works. But most Muslims... Just like, most, just like most Christians don't really know much about the Bible, most Muslims really don't know much about Islam. Um, and I think if it's not like people are like, oh, that's good, because if they did know about Islam, they will all be like killing us now or something. Like, that. like actually, I think if most of them knew about Islam, they would be like, what the fuck is this? Like, uh, I think if more... <laughs> I think if most Muslims re and really understand what the Quran is teaching it, they would not want to have anything to do with it. Um, you know, 
but so I, I ex maybe you need to start classes on, on the Quran. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, even 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 there are many people in Iran, for example, that have memorized the Quran cover to cover, but they have no idea what they memorize because it's in Arabic, and they don't really pay attention to the translation. They just know how to recite it. But if I just make up, a, you know. You know, verse in, in the translation and tell them this is in the Quran, they might believe me because they have no idea what they're reading, right? And even the Arab speaking uh, Muslims that have memorized the Quran, so they don't really pay attention to what they're reciting. Or the, you know, I, I mean, even when I, became, when I became an atheist, I was still in Iran. Even as an atheist, somebody told me about the verse in the Quran. I was like, that's not there. That's no way that some of the verses like so and then I looked at it like holy shit, that's there. Like <laughs> like how is this there? How is how is this possible? How is this nobody told me that this verse is here? Like do, has anybody else like this isn't everybody else's shelf? Like, have you guys read this? Did you know this? I went to my parents, like, didn't you know this is in here? And I'm like, they were like, no. Um, so I mean and a lot of people are like, well, if they're not following Islam, then they're not really Muslim. I mean, I mean they are, because that's not how the def uh, definition of Muslim works. I mean, uh, you could be a Muslim, but not really a good Muslim. The list, you know, because you're, good, you're, you're too good to be a good Muslim, right? Um, Sorry, how's that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're a good Muslim, you, if you're a really good Muslim, then you're a terrible human being, I think. Because you're, if you're, right? So, um, but but you learn what you learn in school is that most Muslims are going to go to hell. Well, even mo not just most people, even most Muslims, because just being a Muslim that doesn't mean that you are going to follow Islam. It means you, you can still sin as a Muslim, right? Just like you could be a Christian but a sinful Christian. Just because you're a Christian, that doesn't mean you're following all the rules. But the Christian knows or thinks he's going to, to heaven because he's forgiven and rules aren't that important, beliefs are. So, yeah. But we, in, the, in the Muslim world, that's no. not the case. You never know. Okay, so this is one thing that I think in Islam it makes a bit more sense than in Christianity. Because in, in Christianity, you have, you have all sins are the same and all sins are forgiven through Jesus. I mean, if I punch in the face and then go ask forgiveness for, to Jesus, then he, if he forgives me, I'm good. It doesn't really matter if you forgive me or not. In Islam, the, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I would. But <laughs> and when an atheist forgives somebody, it means something. Okay. <laughs> right. But in Islam, you have sins against God and sins against man. And if you sin against God, for example, sins against God, like you miss a prayer, you don't fast, or you, just, you know. Then, if you then you don't you just need God's forgiveness, and then you're good. It's called tobe. But if you sin against man, then you really can't go around that person to God. You actually God won't forgive you unless the person you've wronged forgives you. You don't have original sin. So in Islam, actually, this got me into a lot of trouble. And you don't have sin before the age of reason in Islam. Right? So in, his, in Christianity, you're born with sin? Wait a second. <laughs> so are you referring to jumping out of a window with a little bit of trouble? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, tell the story. So, okay, so in Islam, you are, they say, like, you can, it doesn't make sense for a baby to have to sin. And I agree. Um, they say, like, you can't be held responsible for what you do until you hit the age of reason. And... In Iran, they told us, and I, and I know now that these this numbers are different for other Muslims and for most other Muslims, because a lot of Sunnis are like, ah, oh, I mean, but you're telling us it's not Islam because that's not how we were told. Okay, yeah, but that's how I was, what I was told, okay? Uh, the age of reason for boys is 15, and the age of reason for girls is 9. You know, they tricked us in school. They told us this, this shows how pro-woman Islam is because it's telling you that women are smarter than men. And they're like, but... The, but but then I realized that it actually has less to do with that and more with the age of marriage. Because you have to be able to consent to marriage, so the age of reason is also the age of marriage. So, yeah, so it's 15 and 9. That means there's no such thing as sinning before age 15. Uh, you know, for, for, and okay, so here's the loophole that I found in the system. I was like, because, okay, because I, when I was a kid, I was, so, I was so, so scared of going to hell. 
I actually even lit, lit a match one time and put it in my arm just to see how much it feels to burn, right? And I was like, there's no way I can tolerate any of this. They told us, if you just do the smallest sin, you're going to be experiencing the heat of a thousand suns for, for years, for a smallest sin. Like, what the hell? Like, I, can, I can't even tolerate this match on my skin for two seconds. And like, okay, there's no way I'm, I can go to hell. There's no way I should, I should find a way out of this. And they told us, okay, so they told us that there is no sin before the age of reason. And, but they also told us that suicide is a sin, right? But not if you do it before the age of age 15. I'm like, oh, so if I kill myself before age 15, because I'm dying pure, ma'asum, I will just go to heaven. Yes, suicide is an unforgivable sin, but not if I do it before age 15. So i like, okay, then I just have to kill myself and I'll get guaranteed heaven. And I just, and I made sure that I checked that with my school teacher, like or Islamic pirate, she, like school teacher. I'm like, listen, why don't I just kill myself and make sure that I don't go to hell? And he told me like, okay, the reason why you shouldn't do this is because you get the shittiest part of heaven if you do that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like if you were 72 virgins, how many would you get? I have no idea. Uh, like if you were 72, would you But these, like, they say like, okay, Heaven apparently comes in different layers, like the VIP part for martyrs, and that's where Muhammad is, and that's, okay, that's the top part. Martyrs, heaven is the best part of heaven. But then if you die just because you were died as a kid, they just go to the lowest part of heaven. I thought, you know, I don't give a shit. I, I'll take a parking lot as long as, <laughs> as long as I don't burn. Okay, if that's the only reason, then I'm out. I'm out. I don't have to play this game. I found the loophole. I found the get out of jail free card. And I just quit the game early. And I'll just make sure that I don't burn in hell. So I jumped out of the window of my school. How, how high up was it? It wasn't high enough. <laughs> <laughs> I actually went and looked at the pictures. Um, you know, and they were like, yeah, that's definitely not high enough. Uh, but apparently, I, I, my understanding of, you know, I, I, it looked high enough. What when did I, you land on? Like, obviously not your head, but... I, I broke both my legs, uh, my left hand. I fractured my back. I was in a wheelchair for around seven months. Um, and the only reason why I didn't try it again was because I saw what it did to my parents. Like, I saw my dad cry for the first time. I didn't know he was capable of crying. Uh, I saw my mom just collapse on the ground when she came to the hospital. And I felt very guilty about what I did to them. I was like, okay, I'm never going to do that again. And then I hit age 15. I was like, shit, now, <laughs> now I can't commit suicide anymore. And it's, you know, I have to, I'm stuck in this stupid game that nobody ever asked me if I want to play or not. Like, this should have been like, before we came to this world, somebody was like, hey, these are the terms. The penalties are going to help. Do you agree? And I would be like, no. <laughs> right? Like, the consequences of losing seems to be so high. Why would I want to play this game? <laughs> but, so, but now I'm stuck in this game, and now I have to play it. And I'm like, okay, I mean, it can't be that hard. Just don't miss any prayers. Fast during Ramadan should be good. But the problem is that this is also around the age that you start noticing girls. Um, and I'm like, shit, this is harder than I thought. The, because I thought like this is supposed to be easy. The, the problem with God as a tyrant is that he's not just a tyrant of your actions. He's also a tyrant of your thoughts. Because apparently just thinking about things are sinful. Uh, and you think the creator of the universe is seeing how disgusting you are. And he's just seeing all your thoughts. And you always have to apologize. And you say like never again. But obviously you're a teenager. And you're like... Uh, and you feel disgusted of yourself and how and I and I grew up in a very liberal community in, in Iran, so I couldn't understand why nobody else gave a shit about what I, I like. The, the I saw people having sex before marriage, drinking alcohol. You know, my parents were uh, thought that you know I tried to get my parents to pray, they didn't pray, and like they were so annoyed with having this religious police in their ho home and. <laughs> You know, when, when I became an atheist, I told my parents that I'm an atheist now, and the first reaction they had was like, oh, thank God. 
<laughs> they were so tired of my. Really, that was it. That was it. Yeah, they were. They were so tired of my religious bullshit. They were happy, but. But they, they still, they still have some sort of faith. Well, my mom died as an atheist. Eventually, I changed her mind. But don't ask me about the ones that are living because they're still going. Uh, they're still uh, there. Uh, but no, but my my mom died died as an atheist. Uh, I, I remember she, okay, so when she got cancer, I couldn't go see her because if I go to Iran, they'll hang me. Um, and I wasn't sure if they will actually hang me or not. And then I realized there was this teacher in Iran that told, I mean, there are a lot of atheists in Iran. They just have to be careful about who they talk to. Uh, but there was this teacher in Iran that told his class that he doesn't think Prophet John, Jonah was the one swallowed by whale. Yeah, whale or fish depends on which religion? I think what I think Christianity as well. Islam is fi big fish. I don't depends know. On, depends on the uh, yeah. About yeah. So he told his class that he doesn't think that happened. He thinks it's a metaphor or something. I don't know exactly what he said. He got executed. What? He got. Ex he didn't say is against Islam. He doesn't say this. He doesn't think there's a, no God. He doesn't think that you know Muhammad was a, you know pedophile or anything like. That. He didn't say any of those things. He says like I don't think Prophet Jonah was swallowed by a fish. They executed him, and I'm like, okay, I can't go, I, I'm sure now, I, I can't go back to Iran. But, um, I mean, but again, a lot of people tell me, like, hey, I'm an atheist, I am in Iran, and they're like, okay, just don't, yeah, you can be an atheist, and you just tell your friends, you don't, but if you publish it somewhere, obviously, you're going to get in trouble. There's one guy right now on death row in Iran, his name, I think, is Swahil Arabi. He's on death row, he, he said something about Muhammad. Uh, but my mom said that she is not going to die without seeing her son. So they told her that she can't leave the hospital, she had cancer, and she's like, I don't give a shit, I'm gonna go to Vancouver. So she came, she flew over to Vancouver, and she died really shortly after, because she left the hospital and all that. Um, but I remember her in the hospital, and she was in a lot of pain, and I went to see her in, in, in the hospital, and she was, she was listening to the adzan, Right? The Islam, which is Islamic call to prayer. And when I walked in there, she was like, she was embarrassed. It was so sad that she was embarrassed. She was like, Armin, I know this is bullshit. <laughs> but it's really helping with my pain. I'm like, you don't have to apologize. If it's helping with your pain, just listen to it. Like, why are you apologizing to me? But she, she asked us not to write anything religious on her tombstone. She made my dad promise her that when, she, when, you know, in Iran after you die, 40 days after they have these ceremonies for you, she's like, I don't want any of that. My dad had to cancel three attempts of some religious ceremonies, that, you know. But she was very much uh, anti-religious um, by that point. But so yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how we got on the topic of you jumping out the window. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah, so, you yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I decided to, that I need to play this game. Uh, and here's a, here's a very interesting thing. I, when I, I, now I think about it, right? When I was feeling so disgusted of myself because of my thoughts, and I apologized to God so many times, and like, you gave me, you know, this is a weird Islamic thing that they told us, like, oh, you give me eyes, you give me hands, I have this able body, I have a good family, I give me everything I want, and I, I'm so pathetic, I'm so disgusting that I can't even follow some, you know, even control my thoughts. But at least, at least I could tell myself, like, you know, one day I'm going to get married and it's going to be fine. But imagine if I was gay, right? Then how much more disgusted I would be feeling, you know? And I would think, like, I would never have a, you know, at least one, you know, if, I, if you're straight, you think, like, you know, one day it's going to be fine, right? But if you're gay, then you're going to feel disgusted with yourself and you think there's never a way out of this prison. You know, you, you imagine how uncomfortable it must feel to really hate who you are and really be disgusted by who you are all the time. Like this is, this is the kind of psychological trauma that I think people don't understand as the cost of religion. When people talk about the cost of religion, they think about explosions and suicide bombers and war. But if you add up all this trauma and all this, like, imagine how many people that love each other, uh, with each other, are not with each other because of religion. Um, imagine how many 
parents are going you know to hajj instead of taking their kids to disneyland or having some better you know or, or going to mosque and spending so many times just praying instead of spending a little bit more time with their kids it's not just about war and explosion if you add up all the small little miseries here and there the cost of all of that i think is even more than you know suicide but i mean yeah that's tragic as well but i think for example in philippines right i lived in philippines for a year and this is a country that does suffer from overpopulation. Not all countries suffer from overpopulation, but this is one country that does. And it's a, it has a, lot, a huge poverty po problem there, right? But this is a country where it's very Catholic. And because of the previous pope, a lot of people there really, really hate anything that could stop a pregnancy. I mean, I remember when I was there, I went to the pharmacy and we were buying condoms. And the pharmacist, the pharmacist was telling me this is bad. The pharmacist. <laughs> and this is a country where uh, it was one of the only two countries in the world that there's no such thing as divorce um, because it's anti-biblical. And uh, you have a lot of pregnancies at around age 13 and 14. Um, and the parents force their girls to marry. Sometimes they're rapists. Uh, they force their kids to marry their rapists without any possibility, possibility of divorce, because there is no divorce unless you're rich and you could get somebody to make it seem like you were never married to begin with. Uh, but imagine all the cost to the economy and also to all these other people experiencing this because of you know, this religious belief. Again, this is, if you add all that, this is not what people think about when they think about the cost of religion. They, they just think about boom and newsworthy stuff. There's a lot less newsworthy, uh, you know, more subtle, uh, less interesting cost to religion, which you add, add it up, it's just, it's, just, it's just so much, you know? It's, it's amazing the parallel because we, we, have, we, have, we still say we when I talk about Christians. Um, we, do you do that? Um, no, no. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've been in the ministry for two and a half years, yeah, so okay. I'm still a little fresh. Right. But, um, but those parallels are, are identical, yeah. you know, except we have this thing in the New Testament that if, it, if something causes you to sin, you cut it off. Oof. Yes. I mean, just think, you know, that's yeah. brutal, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I know, actually, I've, I've heard it's, stories people actually done that, but it's, no, it's a parable. Actually, there was, a, there, was a, there was this kid in uh, Pakistan that did this because the teacher asked who here doesn't love Muhammad. And this kid apparently didn't hear the question. And he raised his hand. And people, I mean, then he realized what the question was. And he was like, oh, like he was so ashamed that he went home and he cut off his own hand. And, and people praised him. People were like, look how good of a Muslim this is, that even though we understand that he didn't make a mistake, it was a mistake, but like we don't blame him, but he himself has loved Muhammad so much, this is how much you love Muhammad, that you will cut off your own hand because you accidentally said that you don't love Muhammad. Well, you jumped out of a window. Yeah. Like, I mean, you must be okay. used for your faith. N well, no, because I was trying to quit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but people say that that was ridiculous, and it was, but even to this day, I think, given the premises, my conclusion was solid. <laughs> like, the problem was not my reasoning, the problem was the premises. You know, if the premises of my argument is true, so, solid, a solid logical argument will give you the conclusions that I gave. And I, this is why I don't understand why more, more, more people are not doing, jumping out of windows, because they should be, if, if, if the premises are true. This is the problem. The problem with religion is the is the premises. You know, it, the fact that a lot of Muslims or a lot of Christians are not, you know, doing the things that in in Islam or Christianity, is you know, is because they're you know the good people. But if you actually take the text seriously, then a lot of what you see. You know what ISIS does, or what all the you know, all fundamentalist Jewish people or fundamentalist Christians do. They, 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 what they do makes sense sure. if the premise of their if their religion is true. That's the unfortunate thing. Westboro Baptists, right? And they're they're living out their faith fairly accurately. Right. 
Yeah, and, and yeah, but the, the good thing is that when you talk about Muslims, a lot of people think about Muslims as just Muslims, right? And nothing else. So they tell me, like, Armin, you think Islam is so horrible. You think Islam is against humanity, it's against women, it's against gay rights. But I know so many Muslims that stand for gay rights. I know this Muslim that stands for women rights. I know this Muslim that, sa that want peace. I know this Muslim Even that... Islamic, uh, everywhere, everywhere, yeah. I like to give me examples. There are many examples. Uh, they fight for secularism. Muslims that fight for secularism. There are Muslims that fight for free speech. There's a ton of them. And like, yeah, and you should give the credit to them, not to Islam. Because there's nothing that they're doing that is because, in what, even if they say it, there's nothing in Islam that endorses what they're doing. You, why are you giving, instead of giving them credit for doing you know, good things, things that we support, things that are worth supporting, why are you giving the credit to an ideology that has always stood against these values, right? If I show you, if I show you a thousand Muslims that enjoy knitting, does that make knitting an Islamic thing? <laughs> If I show you millions, a million Muslims that enjoy Game of Thrones, does that make enjoying Game of Thrones an Islamic thing? Their Muslims are not just Muslims. There are many other things other than Muslims, right? Like, I'm an atheist, but I'm also, that's not the only thing I am. I'm also a humanist. I'm also a skeptic, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> There are, many, there, are many other, there are many other things that influence me that other than my atheism. There, I have a lot other sources of influence in, in, my, in, my, in my worldview. And Muslims, their Islam is only a one source of many other things that influences their opinion. And we argue, and we're, we're, we might be wrong, we're open to, for them to tell us that we're wrong. We think that the less Islam is the influence, the better. We think that Muslims are influenced by enlightenment values. That we think they're influenced by their own humanity, by their own sense of sympathy and kindness. They're influenced by the movies they watch, the podcasts they listen to, the YouTube channels they follow. Islam is just one of those many things. So when you say Muslims and you just you know, conflate what a Muslim does with Islam, you're ignoring the, you know, 99% of the other things that is influencing them. We think that 1% is not, uh, that is the source of influence in their behavior, which is Islam, the more that is the influence, the worse they are and the worse society is, right? When we, when we fight against Islam, we're not just trying to say, like, Muslims to become ex-Muslims, even though we're very good at that, right? getting ex-Muslims out of Muslims. We are also fighting for even if people remain Muslim, if we promote enlightened values, as long as we're reducing the influence of Islam in people's lives, that's still a win. That's still a win. Give, give me a sense of, and we're going to open this up for questions, because I don't know where I've directed this interview to, but uh, so it's 40 years now since the revolution in Iran. Right. Um, Oof. What I mean, what's happening culturally? You know, you hear some. Okay, we need another like hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a... I'm, I'm curious about the 60 year olds. So people who were 20 right. when the revolution happened. Prior to 79, they were, you know, the clothing was quite different, and you know. Yeah. What is that demographic? Oh. Is it? Is it? A, is, are they? There are many. Dem there are many different groups right now, and each one of these groups try to claim that most people in Iran believes in what they believe. So, okay, so there's so many, I don't know how to, we have, we have a lot of people that are religious that support the government. We have a lot of people that are religious that are against the government. We have a lot of people that are very, very against Islam, very much, passionately. So much so that some, maybe if the, some alt-right people in the West meets them, they would be like, okay, cool it down with your anti-Islam. <laughs> no, I, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's very, I mean, these are people that their lives have been uh, controlled by Islam for 40 years. They're freaking tired of it, right? And the, we have anti-Islamic people in Iran that are against 
the government. And surprisingly, this is something that I discovered in the past few years, we have anti-Islamic young people in Iran that support the government. And I, I can explain to you how that works, but that will take, I don't know, but that will take another. Is there change? Do you see any kind of loosening, any kind of reform? Ooh, the reform is a dirty word in yeah, Iran yeah, yeah. because it has been used as a way to give people false hope. It, it, most people there now, I think this is something that is this is something that is uniting moral people, whether the religious support the government, don't support the government. This anti-reform view is something that most people uh, agree with. Uh, the, so, okay, so what I can tell you is that the atheist community in Iran is is growing very fast, but not all of it is good. A lot of it is good. Um, a, a lot of it is also problematic, right? So we have a lot of atheists in Iran that are also humanists, right? And support human rights. Uh, but we also, have, I'm just being honest, okay? Don't, don't hate me for saying that. I know I lose a lot of my fans in Iran when I say this, but we also have a lot of people in Iran that their hatred for Islam has um, translated into a hatred for Arabs. Right, then they see um, Islam as this foreign Arab invasion of the superior Iranian culture that was so glorious before the Arab invasion and these barbaric Arabs have came and ruined everything that was great about Iran. Um, the, but what we try to convince these people of is that you know, Iranians are a victim of Islam but so are the Arabs. Uh, Arabs are as much a, a victim of Islam as, uh, as are Iranians, and we try to introduce them to a lot of Arab atheists that are fighting um, the same fight that we're fighting just to try to um, you know, you know, soften that, you know, mitigate that view a little bit. And uh, you know, one, one hashtag that was trending, this is, this is another example of how, I mean, a lot of people explain it, like when I say these things, a lot of people try to say like, Armin, you don't understand, these people are, have, have lost so much to Islam. This is why these views are so common. And I also say like, yeah, I mean, I understand the explanation, but explaining something and excusing it is two different things. Um, there was a hashtag trending in, in Farsi on Twitter, and the hashtag was translated to a mullah for every tree. And basically, the, the meaning of that hashtag was once we have a lot of these, a lot of these people are very confident about the fact that they are going to topple this government at some point. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure how how cert, why they're so certain. I mean, for the past 40 years, I've been keep hearing that any day now, like tomorrow, this government is going to fall. But it's been 40 years, and they keep hearing the same promises. But this hashtag was saying, well, eventually when we topple the Islamic Republic of Iran, there would be a mullah hanging from every tree in Iran. That's what they were promising. And there, it was another, pro so th these are things that we have to admit, like not just in Iran, we have in, within our own atheist republic community, we noticed that after the New Zealand shooting, there were a lot of people that were praising the shooter within the atheist republic community. So we have to address the problems that we have in our community, we can't shy away from, you know, addressing you know these things. We can't. A lot of atheists, when they when they see these things in our community, they say, "Oh, I thought all all atheists were supposed to be smart or enlightened or something like that." Um, and I I usually joke and say, "Well, if you thought all atheists were smart, then you're proof that that's not true." But where did you get that? <laughs> I mean, where did you, where did that assumption came from? Like, we're, we're not asking to be treated as, you know, be seen or treated as better. We have our own fair share of racists and homophobes and assholes. And we, you know, we're, we are like other people. We want to normalize atheism. We don't want to, we don't want to claim that we're better than other people. We, we got the answer to one question right. One question. Is there, an evidence, is there any evidence for God? No, okay? We got that one right. That doesn't, <laughs> but what are, that doesn't mean that we're right about other things, right? Like, what are the, you know, a lot of us were used to be uh, religious and now we're atheists. Do you really think that 
everything we were wrong about just one thing and now we're all good like it, obviously we're going to have a lot of disagreements in our community we 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 what i we have to accept that you know there's going to be see the gay rights movement right, when it happened when it became very popular in in the west in the 1960s and 1970s we since then we have made a lot of progress with the, gay, with the gay rights community. And every time I say this, I also have to say that, yes, I know we still have a long way to go, but we can't deny that we have made a lot of progress. But what is it that gay people have in common? They're just, they're all gay. There's nothing else, right? We have left-wing gay people, we have right-wing gay people, we have racist gay people, we have, you know, we have humanists, we have uh, you know, we have religious gay people, we have atheist gay people, um, and they, they, there's probably a lot of disagreement within that community. But that doesn't mean that they can't get together and, you know, one thing that might unite most of them is that it's not okay to treat, to, to be shitty to people just because they're gay. That was enough for them to build communities and, you know, s tell to the world that you can't just treat us like this forever, right? We, you know, we're not going to take it, right? So. As atheists, I think if we're, ask, we're asking the relig religious people to just be okay with us as atheists, if you disagree with us, I mean, we are also trying to convince people that, you know, why there's no God, but before we even try to do that, we're trying to at least convince religious people to just get along with us. It's, it's not, it's, it's okay, like we disagree, it's not that big of a deal, calm down, right, it's, it's good. Um, but if we're asking religious people to accept us as neighbors, brothers, sisters, uh, co-workers, even if we disagree with each other, then maybe we should do the same thing within our own atheist community, but to each other. We should be okay with each other. I mean, when I say okay, it's not like, don't let go, don't, you don't have to let go of your disagreements. You can still passionately disagree with each other, but learn how to get along with people that you have strong disagreements with. We should be able to do that with our own community if we're asking other people to do that with us. Yeah. All right, we don't have a second mic, but let's, uh, um, let's ask some questions. And um, I might regulate these statements prior to the questions uh, to get the question going eventually, but, but uh, just hopefully I don't offend someone when I do that. Uh, gentleman in the red with a new t-shirt. Well, thank you, I just, I just purchased that t-shirt. <laughs> uh, I have a very good question. I'm a mathematician from Mount Blue University, and they just did cancel your event uh, recently. Not very well. And I'm, yeah, very, I'm actually very grateful that so, they. Actually, <laughs> frankly, I saw. So, anyhow, I just want to ask you the following question. First of all, I'm amazed that your uh, your event was canceled because of COVID. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, I want to ask you what is the process that you went through to lines them of insane social justice warriors who <laughs> have zero rationality in them. I moderated a debate. This is underrated. I moderated a debate where a third of one hundred, I can't do it, it's a mathematician, were claiming that there is no such thing as a biological woman, that it's a social construct. No such thing as what, I'm sorry? A biological woman. Ah. Yeah. Just for humans or all animals? I'm losing faith in the kind of the Western people being able to rationally think. And that is, that is why I fear it's not so much, because it could provide a replacement, which is fairly tangible. It's working in a, I don't know, what of the world. So I'm actually afraid that we are so stupid that we'll adopt this just by our stupidity. So would you give me an advice how to engage in that blind stem of social justice Nazis? <laughs> Well, is what you're afraid of is specifically Roman uh, Empire fall and accepting Christianity. I see a bit of an analog when the Roman Empire became a little bit insane with the lead, maybe. Right. I don't know if it's a lead issue now, and so and they adopted Christianity at the time. It resembles what could happen to us the day of Mount Rome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean. Okay. So I mean. So we are. I mean, I'm going to tell you to do something that we're not doing because we're just ignoring the regressive life and we're just talking to religious people now because we have, it seems like we're talking to a wall with them. But I'm hoping that not everybody is giving up on them because 
I mean, we have, we have, we talked to people that wanted to join ISIS and now they're atheists, right? Um, I mean, if we're not giving up on ISIS, are we really ready to give up on, you know, the regressive left? I mean, there, there should be, a, I mean, we haven't mastered how to talk. We have a lot of experience on how to talk to religious people, but somebody needs to figure that one out. But we haven't. Um, mm -hmm. Don't give up on everybody. But one thing I know, the thing is that most people are, and this is going to sound insulting, but I, I'll tell you that it's not. I'll explain why it's not. Most people are stupid. <laughs> That's not an insult, okay? Because it's not their fault, okay? The, the thing is, we can't wait for the world to be not stupid. Because if you were waiting for that, then we're going to be waiting forever, okay? We need to find another way to reach out to people. Because this, we, if we, we can't, because stupid people deserve to be happy, okay? Um, being, not being intelligent is not something that you choose. It's true. Okay, see, it's interesting because when I say stupid, stupid, a lot of people see it as an insult. But if you can't, if you can't use your hand properly, right? You see that as a handicap. You feel sympathy towards people. If you can't see, we see that as a handicap. You feel sympathy towards somebody that can't see. But if you, ha if you can't use your brain properly, all of a sudden, we think you're inferior. You don't, not only you don't deserve sympathy, you all of a sudden deserve hate and ridicule. But I think those are the people that deserve the most sympathy. And they deserve the most protection because these are the people that will be taken advantage of. These are the people that are gullible enough to, to be used for other people's different agenda. And we can't just be like, why can't you just be smarter? Well, they're not, okay? <laughs> We're in, and you can't just abandon these people, okay? We can't we make this, we, we're, not, we're not trying to just make this planet work for smart people. We want to make this planet work for everybody, right? So we need to find a way to, to reach out to more people, even people that are not very intelligent. And even though, here's the thing, intelligence is not very common. But there's another thing that is also a, source, a force for good that is way more common, and that's sympathy. Okay, Intelligence is not common, but a sense of sympathy, a sense of kindness, a sense of fairness, that is, that is way more common, and it's not perfect. Our sense of sympathy is very flawed. It's not proportional to, to the amount of harm that is out there, but it's, it's something to work with. Like, and give you an example. Um, I, I have I've been, I get so tired of tell, giving the arguments for why I don't believe in God that I wrote I turned into a book because I was so tired of repeating the same arguments. But those arguments work for people that are looking for evidence, looking for logical reasoning. But when I have conversation with most people, uh, these these arguments don't work. I have I spent too long trying to explain to this person that was telling I was telling him, okay, why do you think the Bible is true? And he's telling me because you know, it's from God. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you know there's a God? And he's telling me, because it says and so in the Bible. And I really tried so hard explaining to this person why this is cyclical. And he just didn't go through. But to the same person, I argued, okay, let's say you're right, and I'm wrong. I just didn't get it. You got it, I didn't get it. Do you think I should, it's fair for me to burn forever for that? And he got that. He got that because it's just not nice. It's just not, it just didn't seem right. Okay, fine, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. I don't get why God is real. But he understood why I would find it unfair for somebody to be punished forever for that. And because we do have a sense of sympathy towards each other. So I think that's something that we could work with. Yeah. Yeah. I have two short unrelated questions. Firstly, what is your understanding of the reason for Saudi Arabia waging war on Yemen? Question number one. Oh, okay. I, okay, so, oof, again, how much time do you have? Saudi Arabia has been paranoid about Iranian influence in the region ever since the revolution. They, they, Sorry, Iran or Yemen? No, Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen yes. has, has to do with Iran. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, because, I mean, that's the short answer. Ever since 1979, a lot of what Saudi Arabia has been doing is a reaction to Iran's growing influence in the region. And Yemen is one of those places. I got it. Yeah. Second question. 
So as, as you point out, there are at least 13 regimes that are sufficiently threatened by atheism that they're prepared to execute people who, who profess to be atheists. Uh, you, you are, and there are many other countries that are equally hostile, but perhaps not as extreme. Uh, you are the head of an organization uh, leading two million atheists, and it, it would occur to me that the, your visibility is rising. And so my, my question is, um, do you have any fear of assassination uh, or personal jeopardy? And how is, if so, how is it impacting your dedication to the cause? I'm glad my wife is not here. Um, she keeps telling me, why can't we have a normal life? Um, <laughs> and this would scare her. But honestly, I, I, I live in Canada. I feel relatively safe. And honestly, I don't think it should really matter I, a lot of people are like, oh, Armin, you're so brave. I'm like, what are you, I'm in Canada, okay? There are people that are doing exactly what I'm doing in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, okay? In Indonesia, in Malaysia. And honestly, if they're doing what they're doing over there, I have zero excuses to be afraid of anything, right? There was this one... There was this one Bangladeshi blogger that had recently, his, his friend was chopped to death by Islam, Islamic militants. And the reporter was asking him, are you afraid, this is an atheist blogger in Bangladesh, and they asked him, are you afraid that they're going to come after you next? And he was like, yeah, I'm afraid. And like, then I asked him, are you going to keep blogging? And he was like, yeah, I'm going to keep blogging. And then I'm like, why are you going to keep blogging if you're afraid? And I was like, well, it seems like if I don't do it, there's not that many other people that are doing it, right? So if that was his response, I'm like, if I'm living in a country that not only supports free speech, they will go after people that are trying to threaten my free speech, right? Then I have zero excuses for not continuing. What I'm doing. But yet your wife is still concerned. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... It's very, it's very unfair to her because she's not involved. This gentleman here? Yeah, hi, Armin. I fall down to the Royal University. We, we had a little bit of an email exchange the last couple of days. But uh, so you said earlier, um, you know, if you could just convince, that, you know, there's people you talk to, uh, Muslims, you know, just be with okay, okay with us as atheists. But what, what if you're, you know, by definition, branded as an apostate or, in my case, as an infidel? I mean, isn't that kind of a conversation stopper right there? Um, I, how do you respond to that? You know, because some people argue, well, you, you deserve, by definition, mm -hmm. some kind of punishment or death or whatever. Where does the conversation go from, from there? Yeah, but most Muslims don't believe that. I mean, most Muslims don't know. I, um, if most Muslims that I talk to are like, this is in your hadith. And they're like, no, it's not. I like, it's right there. I'm like, oh, you're not reading it right. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're wrong, but they're, also, they're very wrong about what Islam teaches you, but they're also good people. They don't want this. Okay, so for example, there are verses in the Quran that clearly, clearly tells you that if your wife is disobedient, once you take the first two steps and she's still not listening to you, or if you just fear disobedience, then you're supposed to beat her now, right? It's very clear. If you read it in the Quran, you, it's really hard to get anything else out of that, that meaning. But you can see Muslims, a lot of Muslims, really, really try to make it mean something else, right? And they try and they fail. But why are they trying? Because they don't want it to mean that. They, don't, they are not people that want to beat their wives. They're desperate for this verse to mean something else. Because they are better than that book. Yeah. Yes. Um, you were talking about your sense of safety. And today, uh, at the university, a whole bunch of Islamic students and others gathered. And in a meeting later on, uh, the students' union leader said that these students feel unsafe because you were coming to campus. You yeah. made them feel unsafe. Can you help me understand that? Uh, you, can you help me understand that? <laughs> 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 Wait, emotion, like uh, unsafe emotionally? Unsafe. Okay. I don't understand. 
I mean, they didn't have to come to the event, though. Oh, I know. Okay. But the very, and, and another one said that you came to have hatred. Okay, I, 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 would, I wish they could explain to me how. I mean, I, I don't know how to respond to somebody that is, I wish they would come to these events and openly confront me and tell me how am I, how I am, am I spreading hate. I mean, if they were open, the, the same people that are saying this are also the people that are not interested in having conversations. So mm -hmm. how could I really get an understanding of, I mean, if I'm spreading hate, I really would like to, so for somebody to explain that to me so I could stop doing it. But these are the same people that are not really interested in having a conversation, so I don't know where to go from there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, could I just speak to that really? Yep. So, um, I'm one of the organizers for the vigil that we have on Friday for, for the shooting in New Zealand, uh, for the, the home of the Muslim community. Mm. And they are, at this point in time, uh, very switched on. For the longest time, especially here in Alberta, they've been, We've had lots of anti-Muslim anti groups organized here. Mm. And a lot of times, the, the Muslim community will just be like, you know what, it's like, Allah takes care of me today, takes care of us tomorrow, I'm not worried about it, you know, the usual. Yeah. And uh, that's just kind of how the Muslim community has really been here. But after the shooting, mm. they're now organizing, they're going towards, uh, they're going to legislation saying, okay, we have had a problem here. That we've been kind of asleep to, heads in the sand. Oh no! And uh, and we want to, we want you guys to kind of like just be more aware about it. So everyone is very on edge. But they should be familiar with how ridiculous that is, because people say the same thing about them when there's an Islamic terrorist attack, right? They should be the, the be, they should be familiar with this kind of narrative. I went into a mosque because it was an open mosque day. The mosque were inviting people to come and have a look and meet their fellow Muslims. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I mean, and I went to open mosque in Vancouver, and some Muslims there recognized me as the guy that had an Allah is gay sign and went to, and they, yeah, they, and they told the other people there that this guy is like anti-Islamic and stuff. And they, the mom, I don't know, whoever the guy was, came to me and he was, he's like, you seem like a very nice person, like, but, but just in case you're not, um, I just want to tell you that the people here are very, good people. I know them personally. Please don't come here and like shoot people or something like that. like, what the hell? Like, uh, like I felt, I honestly felt bad for him. Like I could see like, okay, these people are stressed, right? Um, but I also felt like, okay, but imagine, I, want, I should have told him this. I, I didn't tell him this. Like, but what if you came, what if you came to another, another event that we atheists had, right? And you, we say like, hey, religious people come here, and and other people there realize that you're Muslim, right? And Muslim, if you're Muslim, by definition, you're against atheism, right? Uh, but then, if imagine if I came to you like, hey, I know you're Muslim, but please don't shoot anybody here. We're good people, right? And like, how's that different? But 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 I I get, I'm, but it's not their fault. I mean. It's not, I mean, I don't want to blame him because at the same, at the same time as I think his, it's ridiculous that he felt like that, but at the same time I felt bad that he's feeling like that because he's, he's, this guy is pretty stressed out. Um, and they deserve to feel safe. They deserve to feel safe. So I want to be able to have a, but, but again, if we, have, if we have more conversations with each other, the, the thing is that I think that the people that are trying to co confuse the idea that anti-Islamic views is also anti-Muslim, mm -hmm. they are, I'm hoping, unknowingly responsible for putting more Muslims in danger. Because, because what, you, what you're doing is that you're making these people more relevant you're increasing their domain by making anything anti-Islamic also mean anti-Muslim, right? What, what I try to tell Muslims is that you don't want to p push more anti-Islam narratives towards the anti-Muslim people. You're pushing them into the echo chambers where you get more radicalism from. These 
progressive leftists are pushing more of people that are not radicals and silencing them or trying to uh, shame them or trying to uh, demonize them and they're just trying to slowly pushing them into the groups of people that see like you know this is apparently this is my, they tell me this is my home so hey I'm here this is they're, you're pushing me into the place where they say I belong to so where are my anti-Muslim friends here right but if you as Muslims I know you think that we are wrong with, with our anti-Islam opinions but you want the people that are the loudest when it comes to their anti-Islam views, be the ones that don't have an issue with Muslims. That not only don't have an issue with Muslims, they would be at the front lines when, they, when it comes to protecting Muslims against oppression or against discrimination, against uh, hatred. We, you want they, them to be leading the way. So if there's more people that have problem with Islam, we are going to be the first people that they discover rather than the people that will also convince them that they, if they hate Islam, they now should also hate Muslims. Are you, sorry, are you connected to UFC or? Uh, no, okay. I got caught in Montreal, actually. Okay, okay. Because there's an event, we have a, uh, the Amadea, I'm going to butcher the name, sorry, uh, society, there's a, there's a debate coming up a week from yesterday, 27th, I think. I don't think that will be deplatformed, but there's a Christian and I hope not. And an atheist. <laughs> sounds like Christian Muslim and atheist going to bar. <laughs> just sounds like a bad joke. And the question on this one. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank you very much. I'm a big fan of the mention to you. But my name is Francis Wilson. I'm a professor at Mount Royal. And it has been something else there, which I knew there were problems at Mount Royal, but there are serious problems. And I have a couple of questions. The first one is getting at what you're talking about at the beginning, which is this you know, white supremacy. You got it. If white supremacy, fighting white supremacy is tied in with sort of opposition to um, you know, violence against Muslims, you're only going to oppose it if it uh, involves white supremacy. And I, and I don't, I'm just trying to figure out how that all ties together. And maybe just drawing upon Peter's comments, that there's a real, uh, what I call a politically correct totalitarian dimension in many universities and generally, I guess, society. And I'm wondering if that's connected in some way um, to this, that it's just a way of kind of getting, you know, sort of using a white supremacy angle to mm. impose sort of a totalitarianism on people, because people are very afraid of white supremacy mm. and, and, and fascism and Nazism, and, and, and you can kind of rally people behind that very easily. And then the second question is about I don't know if actually Talbot can uh, inform me about this concept in, in Islam. I believe it's called Takiya. It's mm. a lie. It's, it's not it's, that big of a deal. Um, I've heard that this is, I wonder how much, you know, this kind of, oh, it's not about beating your wife, but it's, it's about the tapping or something like that. Like, what is, what's your views on that, and how does that play in the whole thing? Uh, I mean, if okay, so the, I mean, I have a lot of problem with Islam. This Taqiyya thing is uh, exaggerated. Most Muslims have no idea. Most Muslims have learned about Taqiyya from non-Muslims, <laughs> right? Because they constantly talk about it. Um, it used to be. I mean, and it's not honestly. For, I have there's so many teachings in Islam that is wrong. This is not one of them because it's just basically the Islamic version of a white lie. It basically teaches you that. If your life is in danger and they're coming for you, you can, you're free to lie about your faith. That's basically it. It's not a license to lie all the time and any time you want. It's, again, I'm not a defender of Islam. I, there's, Islam is, is a horrific religion with lots of bad teaching, but this one is exaggerated. This one is exaggerated um, and it originally started with Shias because Shias were very much oppressed by Sunnis all the time. And um, they were basically given the license to be able to say that they're not Shias when they're living under Sunni regime, right? That was basically what it was, right? And Sunnis basically, I think, they, they became popular among Sunnis more recently from Shias, but it was originally more popular with Shias. It's, it's basically the Islamic version of a white, white lie. I don't, um, I don't think there's all the, you know, most Muslim people are not like, it's, it's not this giant conspiracy and with these all, all these Muslims that are like, we have to defend Islam. It's, most Muslims 
are worried about other things. You know? Most Muslims are worried what to wear at the party that they're going to go next weekend, or whether the couches that they bought, the color matches the curtains or not, right? Uh, or what grades they're getting, or can they afford this car or not? The, the Islam doesn't cross their mind that often, unless they're very serious or you know they're very religious ones. Even the very religious ones, they're going through the religious motions, like in just the way that you think about brushing your teeth. And you know, if unless you're a scholar, yeah. Because the um, uh, the Sam Harris thing, you know, the pupil uh, done in, in many Islamic yeah. countries, not the worst Islamic countries, but. You know, I mean, those are significant numbers. Yeah, I, I, okay, I'm not saying Islam is not a problematic source. It, it's a belief system, and it's a, it's a huge problem, and it does influence your lives in a very negative way. Um, I do think, like, if, so if, for example, you, I go, if you talk to extremely religious people sometimes, I ask them, like, hey, should an ex-Muslim should be killed because they le left Islam. A lot of times you might get the answer, yeah, I get it. I get it. So if it's in Islam, then it should. And they're like, well, I'm an ex-Muslim. Should I be killed? And they're like, okay, maybe not you. <laughs> 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 right? You seem like a nice person. And like once you, once you actually confront what the like, consequences of what they believe in, a lot of the, the humanity starts kicking in, you know? So, but, but again, I'm not saying that these bad ideas don't have negative consequences. It's just that the consequences is not like Muslim, you insert the Quran as a code and they just follow it and it just like it ruins their life that way. It's a lot more, the, inf the influence of Islam on Muslim life is a negative one, but it's a complicated relationship, right? It's not like you just give me the Quran and tell me what to do. It's not like that. Um, should I answer the first question? Or, uh, really quick, uh, quickly, um, yeah, I mean, okay, so yeah, there, there's, a pro there's a part of the left, the regressive left, that you know, has defined their whole world ideology as, a, as opposition to white supremacy. And, and that's why every, they try to squeeze in all the evils in the world under white supremacy and try to make white supremacy even bigger than what it is, right? Um, and I, I don't know if that answers your question. They, they, just, they just try to see if, it's, if they could relate everything to that. And that's why, um, you know, it's kind of like, kind of like a religion where the original sin is being white and there's no way you could get away with your sinful nature if you're born white and you just have to admit that there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and that all sins can be defined as somehow bigotry and if there's anything else, it's not really important. So it's kind of like a very dogmatic way of looking at the world. I also do want to point out that most of the left is not part of the regressive left. Like we have to, we have, you know, but the regressive left is, is a minority in the left, but they're also the very influential and the loudest ones. And they get the most attention as well. But we, if, we want to, if we want to address the problem of the regressive left, we need the rest of, we need the help of the rest of the people on the left to be able to address it. So we can't just alienate the entire left and be like, you guys, are, you guys have lost it, because most of them haven't. We uh, have a question that came in my text, just old school text. Okay. Um, so uh, what is your case against Islamic reform? That was kind of the topic. Of the oh, yeah. <laughs> so maybe you want to touch on that. I mean, if you are for Islamic reform, then you are for Islam. If you're for Islam, you're basically for the Quran. I don't think the Quran deserves any def defending. If any, if any other book under any other label te was teaching the things that were being taught in the Quran, we will not be making excuses for it. If there was any other book that was teaching you about, teaching you that you should, you should beat your wife, that uh, teaching you how to have slaves, teaching you that anybody that doesn't believe in this book deserves to be tortured for eternity, eternity of screaming in pain. If it wasn't labeled as a religion, we wouldn't be telling people that, hey, let's reform this. I'm like, what the fuck is this book? Like, this, is, this book is promoting hatred. And but, but earlier, you mentioned that even though those things are in the book, practically yeah. people don't practice Yeah, I'm for, I'm for reforming Muslims. Not reforming Islam. Islam cannot be reformed. Muslims are reformed by moving away from Islam. Right. Last question. In the back. Oh. Uh, hey, I'm uh, Ahmed. Uh, I'm a Muslim. 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 Uh, I'm a Muslim.
Those who don't know me, I'm Anthony Seacuber. Hopefully the question though relates. Um, so you, went, you took a trip last week with Drew, uh, who um, yeah. he, sure. heard Drew, he- Shout out to Drew. Yeah. Drew. Genetically <laughs> modified skeptic. Genetically modified skeptic, he's great. Uh, but he took his channel and he actually, with his Christian background, is now doing a lot of stuff related to Islam. I have the opposite tact. I was being a Christian ministry, being a Christian, my uh, voice team seems to resonate mostly with Christians, but I do occasionally get this when you can address Islam, when are you going to start talking about other oh. religions beyond Christianity? And I kind of feel like a lot of us in the room are former Christians, you know, that's who, who we know we can speak to. Um, am I being short sighted in thinking no. that I should stick with what you I should want focus to on whatever you want? Okay? It's kind of like, this is kind of like going to, let's say there's a person that is trying to fight against. Abu abuses against dogs. And you like, if you, what, imagine if I go to her and tell her, what's your problem, why, do, why, didn't, why aren't you not defending cats? Do you hate cats? Like, this is a person that has decided, I don't know why they're focusing on it, maybe, maybe they had a dog that they lost as a child and abused in some way, and that's why they're passionate about it. Maybe they understand dogs more, right? Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe you know, this is this is something that they have an experience with, or, or maybe that's just they're just more interested. They're more passionate about it. this. Is something that interests them the most. The fact is that they found the problem and they're trying to address it. You know, so if you want to focus on all animals, focus on all animals. If you want to focus on dogs, focus on dogs. You are better than most people that are just sitting in the corner and not doing anything and tell, telling you that you should either focus on everything or just focus on something specific. You are doing something, okay? And that's great. Just focus on whatever you want to focus. You, you could either do all religions or if you want to focus on one. We get that as well. When we, when we talk about Islam, for example, we're like, why are you focusing? Like, all religions are a problem. Like, it's, the example I give is like, imagine if you have like a fundraiser uh, to, to fight against cancer. And if somebody shows up and like, why not AIDS? Why are, do you guys not care about AIDS as a problem? Why is this not a fundraiser about all diseases? Like, well, go make a fundraiser about a if, to, to fight against AIDS. Like, but sometimes you want to focus, sometimes you don't want to focus. Sometimes you want to talk about all religions. Okay, another thing I say like this, people say, okay, you're focusing on Islam or Christianity or Hinduism or whatever. Why not all religion? Okay, well then, I'm, I'll take you the next step. Why just religion? Why just not all dogma? Okay, fine. Why not all dogma? Like, why just dogma then? Why not all bad ideas? Like, okay, fine. All bad ideas. Like, why just bad ideas? Why not all bad things? Like, okay, all bad things are bad. Okay, is that is that is that general enough for you? Like, <laughs> I mean, okay, Iran is responsible, but I mean, the people that are dropping the bombs on innocent people, you could, that those are the easiest people to point to. But it's not like Iran, Iran is happy that Saudi Arabia is wasting shitload of money in Yemen. And they, they, even if they weren't initially there, even they were like, oh, Saudi Arabia thinks that we're in Yemen, even though we're not, and they're bombing the shit out of it. They're now like, okay, let's give them more excuse to be there by being somehow involved because they are stuck in this war and they're wasting a lot of money and resources and the world, we could use this as a, pro, as, as a way to show how anti-human rights Saudi Arabia is. So Iran is benefiting from this war and is trying to find sneaky ways to make it last longer. But obviously, I mean, so, is a lot of, so are a lot of other countries, but I mean, but at the end of the day, the, the main country that you could point the finger to, because they are, those are the people that are dropping the bond on civilian people, will be Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia first, before anyone else. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Well, 
Yeah, basically, Saudi Arabia is the only villain that looks big as a villain. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yes. Yes, please. I, mean, I want to get back to the question of the uh, Yalkia. Uh, I, I may not be pronouncing that correctly, but I, I just discovered it uh, a little while ago and never heard it pronounced. Um, I would suggest to you that your definition of uh, some Muslims not uh, uh, not wanting to be their wife, uh, not supporting uh, a number of lashes for uh, various uh, sexual infidelities, uh, not cutting off heads, not cutting off a hand and a leg on either side of the balance. None of that. They don't do that. I suggest to you that that is an example of Yaqia itself, because that is contrary to the Quran. Hmm. Quran resulted from the absurd notion of an angel coming down and talking to a rug salesman and telling him that he has been chosen as a prophet. And at that time, of course, the people weren't very rational. And Muhammad went back, and obviously insane. He went back to his village and told people all of these things that kept happening, and 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 that God had through the the angel the angel, I told him these things. And then, of course, thirty years later, all of these people yep, yep, got together. Yep. Oh, let me finish. Well, all of these but, people got together and wrote the Quran, and all Muslims followed the Quran. Hmm. So you're telling me that Muslims who aren't good Muslims, if they don't believe all those things, they don't believe the Quran. What makes them a Muslim? I didn't say they don't believe in the Quran. They just don't know what's in the Quran. I didn't say they don't believe in the Quran. I said they just don't know what's in the Quran. They just don't know what's in the Quran. They don't know what's in the Quran. Most Muslims don't know what's in the Quran. Muslims only know I'm shocked. Excuse me. I'm shocked to know why I'm having a discussion with a professor in the oil was. And he thought back. I said, why? And he said, I'm just trying to remember which surah that is in the Quran. And I said, you've never heard of it. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of moms that know, but he's he's an example. You're talking about a mom. Uh, you're talking about an imam. Yeah, Mo okay, but it's the same thing with Christians. Do you think most Christians think that women shouldn't be able to teach? No, but that's not my question. That's not what. That's not my question. I'm just talking about something that is very similar, okay? Because most people are most people are familiar with, even though they have no respect for Christianity, they most people here have been exposed to Christians, just like I've been exposed to a lot of Muslims. And I'm not saying there's the fact is that a lot of Muslims believe in horrible things that teaches you about Islam, that that Islam teaches, but a lot of them don't. Both of these are true, but my, a lot of people here have been exposed to a lot of Christians. That's why I talk about Christianity, because it's very similar. Most Christians that I think you know, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Don't see an issue with a Christian woman teaching or having authority or having a position of leadership. Does the Bible not teach you that women shouldn't have authority, that they shouldn't be teaching? Yeah, so how, that's the same thing. It's, it works the same way. How is it that the Bible teaches you that women should ha shouldn't have authority, they shouldn't have a position of leadership, and yet most Christians don't believe in that? It's the same way with Muslims. Well, perhaps there's an English word for Yaqia. I don't believe that these Christians, all of them, are lying. I think they just don't think that that's right. I think this, most Christians think that women should be able to teach. I don't think, I, it would, I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe all these Christians are lying, but I think. <laughs> At some point, accept abortion. That's because the, the, the reason, in, reason in humanity is falling away from the absurdity of religion generally. So they're struggling to capitulate to these things, and that's what that's what Muslims right. are doing. Well, but yeah. In both cases, they're trying to preserve Islam and Catholicism for Christianity. Well, I mean, okay, there's some truth to what you're saying, but this is this is not how they see it in their brain. This is this is this is how a meme survives by trying to re remain relevant, right? And this is why I'm against Islamic reform because when Muslims are being convinced of better ideas, better ide ideas better than Islam, there are some group of people that try to convince them that hey, those better ideas, those 
humanist, you know, woman-friendly, gay-friendly ideas that you're now convinced of is, is still compatible with Islam. I try to stop that. I was like, these are people that are being convinced that these are barbaric ideas. If they're already convinced that this is barbaric ideas, we don't need to convince them that it's compatible with Islam because the less that reform pro process is successful, the, the sooner we're going to be able to get rid of Islam, right? Because a lot of people think you need reform for Muslims to become you know, more humanist, more gay friendly, more you know, women rights supporting. Like, no, these are people that are already being convinced of this, but they have such an emotional attachment with Islam that they want to keep that. They want people to give them excuses to keep Islam. But because they've already been convinced that these are barbaric ideas, we don't need to give them that excuse because they already are for better ideas. In fact, if we don't give them that excuse that Islam supports this, they are more likely to be like, okay, well, then fuck is long. Right? Would there not also then be a case for allowing for some degree of reform as an ex evangelical pastor, now atheist person who tried to live a straight life, now married to my husband? Um, and neither of those are related, believe it or not, uh, being an atheist and gay. Um, but the idea that, that things are progressive. I think I have a better opportunity at getting people to say, I'm done with Christianity if they've gone through the life of mental gymnastics to try to deal with social standards that we're now accepting. Um, so the reform aspect in Christianity, especially around things like uh, you know, the, the LGBTQ community or women's roles in leadership, that kind of stuff, because we've allowed for those reforms to progressively take place, there's a better opportunity for people to eventually abandon the ideals because they're, they're, they're just tired of the mental gymnastics and there is so much going on. So is there not a possible case for Islamic reform to take the same progress? So we basically kind of wear them down to it not being relevant mm -hmm. so they can get rid of it. Okay, okay so, so first, first of all, I just want, I, I know you didn't mean like that, but I'm very sensitive about the using of the word allowing, allowing because we're not stopping anybody okay. from saying like, it's not, if, if I argue Islam, against Islamic reform, people are always tell me, why can't you let the reformers do their thing? Like, did I put a gun to their head and tell them not to reform Islam? I'm just, I'm just suggesting that there's a better way, right? Um, and and th but I know you didn't mean it like yeah, that. Yeah, so let's yeah, take the yeah. word allow out and maybe some through with, yeah. with support I just, or not support. Yeah, yeah. Not, I, I'm in favor of not supporting. Yeah. Um, again, again, so I just also want to say I support a lot of thing, a lot of the things that Muslim reformists do. But not when, the only thing that I'm against it is that when they label it Islamic reform. Because a lot of Muslim reformists are fighting for a lot of the things that we fight. And we support them on those fights. The only objection we have is that we just want them to not give credit to Islam for any of that, right? Um, and the, the, the progress that a lot of people think, a lot of people suggest that the, pro the way that this progress works is that people change, uh, you know, must you know change change Islam or Christianity in a way that is more compatible with modern with modern life, and then eventually they might leave it. It it's it's actually it's not that people change Islam, and now they're living more modern or more humanist lives. It's, it's the other way around, right? They wanted to live more humanist lives, and now they're trying to change Islam. But the thing is that the, the step that we wanted them to take was already reached in the first place. That second step was unnecessary. That second step is helping Christianity and Islam remain relevant when when they should die both of these religions should die okay and we don't need to give them that sense of comfort they already took that step they already took like if you and these changes it's not they're not coming from people that are reforming islam or christianity these these desperate attempts to make christianity or islam mean something else is coming from people as a reaction to the changes that have already been taking place. The, cha the, 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 the changes that we are forcing to Muslims and Christians is coming from outside. Is these superior enlightenment values are so good 
that are so convincing that more Christians and more Muslims are being influenced by them more than their scripture. Okay? And we are forcing Islam and Christianity to become less relevant and as a desperate defense mechanism, Islam and Christianity are trying to be like, no, this was us that were promoting these Enlightenment values. And we just have to, you don't get to say that. You don't get to claim that because you went always against these values. You have always stood against these values. And now that you're becoming less relevant in some circles, you're trying to act like you're something different. And we're not going to let you pretend like, pretend that. Christianity is the same thing. So it's, mm -hmm. someone doesn't read the Bible and say, oh, we should be more friendly to the LGB, LGBT community. Mm -hmm. You don't get that out of the Bible, they get that first, mm -hmm. and then they try and they try. find something that will help yeah. them support that so the cognitive distance. Yeah, yeah. But, but given that, that we already made that first step, step we, we don't need to give them that. that. Yeah. A lot of people are like, well, if it promotes them being more LGBT rights friendly, why not give them that excuse? Because they're already there. They're already there. You don't need to give them that comfort to keep the Christianity with them. Well, first of all, con uh, thank, congratulate them and thank them to be, to accept an atheist and tell them that this is a big deal. Tell them that they are showing that to the world, to, to, to the rest of the community that, you know, that they're accepting of atheists. Because again, we're not going to, we're not going to back down or tone it down on our anti-religion views and that. We're not going to, but uh, we could do that while we appreciate people that accept us, right? Just like we, if, if Muslims want to tell us how much, or Christians want to tell us how much they're against atheism, right? We could still accept them while not asking them to tone it down, right? They can do the same thing to us. They should not require us to tone it down on our views against Islam and Christianity to be able to be friends with us. A lot of, a lot of um, religious people say like, you know, I'm okay with atheists as long as they're not so anti-religious. I'm like, you yeah, know, that, that's, not, that's not a condition because you, you, your book talks about torturing us. Your book talks about your, I know maybe you don't think it does, but it does, okay? Your book talks about beheading us, torturing us for eternity. And I, I'm still talking to you right now, right? You're endorsing a book that wants me beheaded. And I think like you're probably a nicer person than that. And I, I'm tolerating that. You should be able to tolerate me telling that this is all nonsense, okay? That's, that's not a condition that you should have for my friendship. You should be able to be friends with me while I shit on your religion. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions, yes. Um, so uh, uh, the SPLC uh, has branded quite a few, uh, let's say, white supremacists of color uh, in uh, recent uh, wait, wait, past. Wait, wait, wait. Well, it's like Wajid and oh, uh, you're joking. Yeah. Are, are white supremacists now, <laughs> uh, uh, despite the ridiculousness. Okay. Uh, oh, Wajid is not anymore. Did I miss Wajid? Okay, well, Wajid. I mean, if you don't get accused of being a white supremacist, at one point in doing this kind of stuff, you're not really doing your job, right? So, <laughs> so I guess my question here is, what would you say to the people from Mount Royal University who said that you were peddling hate and, you know, inspiring white supremacy? Uh, tell me how. I, I, that's very interesting. Like, tell, show me. Like, I really, this is what I wanted, this, this is why we need to have, like, okay, so very interesting accusation. And, <laughs> I'm going to say that your accusation is exactly why we need to have more conversations. Because if I am, I'm hoping that you, you could point it out to me, right? So why are we saying that we shouldn't have these discussions? Because I don't want to support white supremacy. And if I showed up, if you came to an event where I am, you will maybe will be able to raise your hand and tell me exactly how I'm doing it so I could stop. Or I could show you how ridiculous you're being. <laughs> Can I quickly interject as a mathematician? 
Why don't you say, you know, white? Wouldn't that be much easier? Mathematician only proves, there's many ways to disprove something. Yeah, but it's Uncle Tom accusation. You are not white. It's an Uncle Tom, you know, accusation. Being a puppet of the, you know, you're being, you're trying to please your white masters or something like that. Yeah. That's what this I mean, I've heard it all. So. <laughs> I imagine you have. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's thank her for being here tonight, for taking the time. <laughs>